The first part of this lesson is about indentation. The ingenious idea of Guido Van Rossum, Python's inventor, is to make a rule of what was formerly just good practice. Once, in order to write some correctly indented code, we needed to keep it in mind. We had to carefully and correctly indent our code ourselves, for our own sake, and for the sake of the eventual readers. Now, with Python, this becomes a rule. Incorrectly indented code simply doesn't work. In fact, Python uses indentation to mark the beginning and the end of a block of instructions, as we'll see further on in this lesson. A very useful source of not-so-well-indented code is the International Obfuscated C Code Contest website. We find right here an example of code that's quite hard to read. This code is not indented at all, and it is working C code. This one is another example of poorly written code, but it's part of the contest, so that it makes sense here to see it so poorly written. Here, the contestant went so far as to write IOCCC with his code. After an example of non-readable code, let's see how Python tries to correct this problem. We open a file with idle, a new window. Let's examine the for instruction, which is quite different from the for we can find in other languages such as C, Visual Basic, or Java. Python's for accepts an iterable as argument. What's an iterable? It's an object that can be browsed from end to end according to a preset order. An iterable can be a list, a string, a tuple, and so on, as we'll see in the following examples. Before proceeding with four, let's have a look at a built-in function of Python named range. Range accepts three parameters, as we can all see. More specifically, we'll now take start and stop into account. Let's now try to execute it. Here it is. Range returns a list of elements starting from the first one passed to range up to the last minus one. Let's now use range for our first four. We print the value of n to be able to check it and execute the line. We can see that after the idle prompt, the values from 1 to 9 are printed. Thus, we can use 4 with range, but we can also use it with a list. Now let's try to create a list with heterogeneous values, some numbers and some strings. Now we'll try to execute, again printing the item value within the body of the four. Here we can see how the elements of different types are printed in the various for loops. We can also print all the characters of a string, which, as we know, is an iterable object in Python. Thus, if we print all the characters of the string fed to the for as argument, we'll see them in a sequence, one after another. In the previous lesson, we had also encountered another type of iterable object, the tuple. Thus, we can also use the tuple with for. Tuple, as you'll recall, is an immutable object. We had printed all the elements of our tuple. Now let's try to see how to exit from a for loop. The relevant specific instruction is break. We write a for with the usual range. We print the value of n, and at a certain point, if n exceeds, say, 5, we abandon the for loop with a break. Let's see how, as n reaches the value 6, the for loop is abandoned, and no further elements are printed. Therefore, the break work as expected. The for loop, like the if block, has its else function. Let's try to copy the preceding instruction, adding an else. We add print and then execute. Nothing gets printed because else is only executed when a for loop is completed. 
Thus, if break is removed and the instruction is executed again, the else is now printed. The way else works may seem strange, but another example is maybe better to clarify its use. Let's move our cursor to the prompt, define a variable value equal to 10, We write a for loop with n between 0 and 19. If n equals the set value, found is printed, and we abandon the for loop with the break instruction seen above. We add else, and not found is printed. What would we expect to happen that found is printed, wouldn't we? And instead this isn't the case. Why? Because we've defined value as a string and not as a number, a mistake to be carefully avoided. So we define value as an integer and not as a string. We copy our for loop, execute it, and this time the outcome is found instead of not found. Because value has been detected, this example maybe clarifies the reason why else follows for with a function thus to be executed when, for whatever reason, we reach the end of our for loop. Another useful way to use for is to have a counter of the current loop. Instead of setting a variable for this purpose and incrementing it, we can then use the enumerate function within for in the following way. We have for i and care. We feed to enumerate the actual object we would have fed to for, that is, in this case, the string we've defined. Now let's print both i and chair. We can see that the value of i is from 0 to 11, while care loops across all the characters in the defined string. Therefore, anytime we need a counter to tell us how many times the current